seemed like we haven't been here forever, doesn't it? I was thinking about this this afternoon, and I thought, when was the last time we had church? It's been, it's been three weeks, but thank you for being kind and understanding that uh, this schedule and work has just been completely off the charts when it comes to craziness. So, First Chronicles chapter 12, and hopefully we're going to try to finish this up, this lesson tonight. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 30 to 32 says this. And of the children of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers. And of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 which were expressed by name to come and make David king. So these are all the the tribes of Israel, each one played a part. And as they would um, be recognized, the tribes, for what they did, they would always bring all of them and say, this is the tribe that did this, this is the tribe that did this, this is the tribe. And so they gave it, not an individual, but a tribe um, recognition or um, fault, uh, fault lane. Another half tribe Manasseh, 18,000, were expressed by name to come and make David king. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. So we've been talking about this aspect of knowing the times. When you look at what's happening around our world, you've got to understand that even if you weren't a believer, something's going on around this world. There's so much uncertainty. There's so much wondering what's going to happen next. You know, when I think about what I hear on the news and, you know, I can't remember ever a time that you would hear so many train wrecks. So many of them where literally our, our infrastructure is falling apart, where bridges are, I mean, I remember the last bridge that was really big was up in Minneapolis, where uh, as it was crossing over, it collapsed and I think 12 or 15 people died. But you have that one in Joplin, that one bridge, they're having to shut things down, the one in Philadelphia is just like, what is happening to our country? And I'm not talking about it from a spiritual mindset, I'm, as, as, but as an individual thinking, there is something crazy throughout our country. You think about two years ago and all the riots and thinking, what, what happened to our, the humanity? And then when you, when I, you know, I've, I've got all kinds of things I'm looking at through Facebook and Instagram and different things that talks about different, you know, literally where people are getting fired from telling someone, don't rob our store. Literally getting fired for trying to keep someone from stealing from them. What? Back when we were kids, we always heard about the robbers getting beat up or other bad things happening because they were doing something wrong. And I'm not an advocate for violence, but I'm telling you, this whole country's just gone nuts. When literally there are people that are, are um, co companies are pulling out of these huge cities because you've got bands of people just walking in and just with bags. And, and I mean, it's blatant, it's open. And I saw shoplifting, and I know when I was a kid many, 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 many years ago that I may have stole a RC Cola and Moon Pie once until I got caught. Uh, but literally, big old bags where people are throwing clothes and groceries and all, and they literally, it's kind of like Santa Claus, load everything up, put it on their shoulder, and walk off knowing that no one is going to stop them. What's wrong? And so understanding the times that there's something that's a catalyst to cause all this craziness. Now, we know as believers, we know the catalyst is that we are, we are getting inching closer to the end times where the end of days and the rapture and um, the Antichrist, the tribute, all that stuff, we understand that because we've been taught the scriptures, as we read the scriptures, that we know something big is about to happen. And, you know, when you think about what's happening in the United Nations and you're hearing about what's happening over in the Middle East and you're hearing what's happening over in Europe, it's so like, wow, what is going on? So understanding the times is important. Now, you can go to an extreme that you're so heavenly minded, you have no earthly good. You can be so consumed with always looking for some spiritual aspect of, of everything that you don't realize that sometimes things just happen just because things happen. 
It's like when yesterday I was going to, to Independence, and while it was nice and hot and dry and nothing, we go over to Independence, and there's limbs everywhere. They go, what just happened? Is it some kind of cataclysmic thinking about what happened in the end times? No, it's just a storm. It's Kansas, it's summertime. So you can overanalyze everything. But these men, that's what the responsibility that when they were supposed to look at everything and analyze it to be able to give the right type of counsel and advice for people to navigate the times. And so the last thing we talked about was the aspect of serving Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> and the Bible says this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Have you just noticed that it just seems like everybody just wore out? I mean, literally just, they just don't have enough strength. It's like they're walking zombies because they're, it just seems like everything they do is just like it's a struggle. But it says this, take my yoke upon you, and what's the next three words? Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest into, unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So learning of him, learning of him as a as an ox carrying the load, as and yet we are the the young oxling as we're walking alongside of the master, learning how to walk, learning how to to carry the load without uh, breaking things or fall, having things fall apart. As we are learning, learn of me to learn the steps, to learn how he thinks, learn how he responds to different aspects of it, and so. As believers, we're going to study the times. we got to learn about serving like Jesus did. Jesus' time was very was turbulent also. When you had the Roman peace, and, and yet you had the Romans conquering everything in every nation. They were basically, they were slaves to the Romans. And even in, in, the, in the Middle East and in, in uh, Israel, literally they controlled everything. And so they had to be careful how they were to respond because they knew that if they stepped out of line, that the Romans would just basically clamp down on them to have total domination and control. And so we see the scriptures. How many times in the Bible does it ever talk about Jesus confronting Roman soldiers? There ain't none. But he did talk about that when someone asks you to carry their pack for a mile, you carry it two miles. And he was illustrating that there were times that if you were walking down the road and a Roman sentry would come through and they were tired, they would literally grab you and say, carry my heavy weight. And they would do it in mile sections. And what he was saying is that it's normal that the Romans would say, carry my weight for a mile, and expected that at the end of that mile section that they dump it and take off and run. But Jesus says, instead of doing the, no the norm, do the extreme of saying, okay, I will carry it, one, because I have to the first mile, but the second mile, because I want to. That's the only time that we know that Jesus ever confronted the Roman soldiers. Now, the Roman soldiers were there at his crucifixion, but Jesus never confronted him because he was a slave in the mindset of the Roman soldiers. Even the fact that when they pierced his side. So when you think about that culture, it was a, it was a turbulent culture with all kinds of things going on, and yet there's a power of serving Jesus. Was it not one of the Roman centurions said this? Truly this was the Son of God. So although he did not openly confront the Roman centurion, the Roman centurion watched and listened and said, there's something different about that person. The power of serving Jesus. See, we may not realize who's watching us. 
We may not realize who's listening to us. We may not realize the, the amount of uh, observation that people have for us. And yet the scriptures tell us no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. The power of serving Jesus is important. If we're going to analyze the times, we're going to say, what are we here on this earth for? To serve Jesus. Plus nothing, minus nothing. But then also, we've got to learn to study opportunity. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 34 says this. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Today is our only opportunity to live. Today is. Not yesterday, because we've already lived it. But tomorrow, we don't know if we have a tomorrow. So study the opportunities given to us. God gives us opportunities to minister in ways to encourage and bless and challenge other people. So studying that, the opportunities God's given to us. Also, we must, we must limit yesterday. No one knows all history and everything about themselves. We need to learn from God who lives our history. Look at Psalms 90, Psalms 90. We must limit yesterday. Psalms 90. There's nothing wrong about talking about the past or learning about the past, but you can't live in the past. I'm thankful for air conditioning. Man, those... Oh, I've had kids in my house, and boy, I mean... Boy, so, so can we turn the air conditioner? No, it's already, I, I keep it at 76, 78 when it's not too hot. Oh, it's so hot in here. Okay, let's go to when I was your age. What's that? I said, get the fans and put them in the windows. Why? Because I'm going to shut the air conditioning off. I'm going to put all the windows up. And in fact, what you're going to do at night, you're going to get your blanket and you're going to sleep on the porch because it's cooler out on the porch than it is in the house. Well, I'm not going to do that. There's bugs. Okay? Do you want bugs and comfortable? Or do you want no bugs and misery? But you don't understand. No, you don't understand. The very aspect of I, what I do since I'm a, you know, working with these kids and I'm not home all the time, there's a little thing called a microwave. Thank God for that invention. Yay. We didn't have microwaves when we were kids. We we're not allowed to touch the stove unless mom or dad told us to cook. We weren't allowed to cook what they told us, how they could, told us, and nothing more. And you yeah, I didn't, that's right. I want to make sure of that. But I literally, I mean, thank God that, that you can take a sandwich from the freezer in less than three or four minutes that thing comes piping hot, and it's delicious to eat. And you're full, whereas you're having to try to pull all this stuff out and get all the ingredients and make everything and then sit down. And in the summertime, we eat a lot of just cold food and stuff like that. But sometimes that said, I want this meal. Dad, it's going to be 100. I don't care. This is what I want. And so you do all that stuff, and then you eat, and then you've got to wash all these stupid dishes. We didn't have a dishwasher. Like my dad said, I got four dishwashers who have very capable hands. Why would I want to pay for something that's going to break down? I know you're not going to break down because there's always someone going to replace you. We had so many things I'm thankful for nowadays. But I can't just say, you know what, guys? I sure do wish I can go back to those days again. No, Absolutely. I'm very thankful. I'm thankful that we have electricity. I'm thankful we have inside bathrooms. I'm thankful that we have uh, padded pews. Now, when I went to Catholic Church, we had those old varnished pews. 
that had no air conditioning. I remember no air conditioning, varnish fuse, you sweat, and your clothes stick to the varnish. And you peel the clothes off there, and you had to walk, get up slowly, otherwise you'd rip your shirts or rip your pants. Yeah. There was so, and so I tell them, you guys don't understand how blessed you are. Well, you're just old. No, I'm experienced. I appreciate what my mom and my dad had back then. But they told me things that they were thankful for in the 60s and 70s that they didn't have in the 30s and 40s. And they wouldn't want to go back to those days. So you've got to limit yesterday. You can learn from them, you can talk about them, but you can't always relate yesterday from today because like anything, what will happen yesterday is a thousand times different just because of the technology and other things of today. You know, I would love to go back to pencil and paper. Only thing I had to worry about was making sure I didn't break the lead with the, pen, with the pencil. Nowadays, you go to a computer and if it determines something goes on in there and it blows up or it short circuits, you've got a way to go get, go buy one, which is up to $1,000. And then you've got to reprogram everything for what you were needing. And then by that time, you've lost a day or two, maybe three days, plus all that information that was saved up. It's, it's not even the same. And yet too many people live in yesterday. Psalms 90 verse 4 says this. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood. They are as, as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. But thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Limit yesterday. We can't live in yesterday. So teach us to number our days. Every number moves forward. Am I right? Except in the counter, because you go to 30 or 31, and you go back to 1. But it's something new every, every time that thing goes from 30 or 31 down to 1. And so time continues moving forward. Calendars continue to move forward. Life continues to move forward. If we're going to live the life that God wants us to live, then we've got to not allow the past to be our, an anchor to hold us back but allow every day for God to move us forward in some aspect of our lives. So we've got to limit yesterday. But then also, we must understand we have a limited tomorrow. You can't know all the future, everything that will happen to you in the future. Let God prepare you today to live in your future. And we know that all things work together for good to them that are called to corner his purpose and to them that are going to do what? They're called, to court, called according to his purpose, it is what it says. But look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So, we are able to live now in better ways because we have learned about it through our past. I am amazed every time I see people that, that are, have lost limbs because of different things that happened in their youth. 
I had an uncle that was run over by a bus in New York City when he was, when he was I think, eight years old. Now, in those days, and from what my mom and my aunt and my grandmother used to tell me, is that after he got out of the hospital, grandpa and grandma would treat him no better, no different than my mom that had two legs. Get up, you're going to live, and you've got at least one good leg. You have a wooden leg. You're going to learn to live with that thing because life moves on. And they were tough. But that man ended up weren't walking, working on the, on the roads of Florida, pouring asphalt in 140, 150 degree at times atmosphere with a wooden leg. He did everything with that wooden leg. He would even beat me in races with that wooden leg. Why? Because he learned to live for the future. He'd come home from work, stink. The first thing he would do is he would take his leg off and put it in his chair and hop to the bedroom and the bathroom and then come back and hop back up there, put his leg on. Uncle Sonny, does it ever get old? He says, sure, beats the alternative. Yeah. It may get old, but I'd much rather have at least the option of living and still being mobile and still be able to have some self-worth because I've had to learn through hard times. And all of us are better because of our past. Because of the experiences that sharpened us and made us more aware, more tender, more compassionate, or empathetic, or whatever, of those things that happened in our past to make us better for our future. So we must limit tomorrow. Verse 24 of Hebrews chapter 11 says this. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for respect unto the recompense of the reward. Moses had, a, had it really good. He had the best house. He had the best accommodations. He had the best of everything. But the one thing that set him apart was that after he was taken out of that ark of bulrushes, he was put by the work and, and, and providence of God in mama's house. Guess what mama got to do for all those years? Teach Moses about the Jewish religion. And so she taught him to start looking at everything through the scope of being a Jew. And by seeing that, he came to a point, and we know what happened, he saw those two, two Egyptians attacking the, the Jews and beating them as slaves, and he ends up killing them. He had to come to a conclusion because if you're an Egyptian, it shouldn't bother you to see you get to beat up a Jew or even kill them or abuse them because the Jews and the Egyptian mindset were nothing but tools for them to get things accomplished. They had no purpose whatsoever but to be there for the, the Egyptian people. Moses didn't look at it that way. Because he came to realize what it says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He realized by following after the Jews and following after what God was t telling him through his mother that his life would be better because he would be, he would be following after the God of the Jews compared to the God of the Egyptians. Limiting tomorrow. It's important. Now, there's some folks that would like to just bury their head in the sand thinking, well, hope everything's going to be okay. You can't live like that. We don't know what's going to happen. We hear prognostications. We hear what they're talking about, that eventually they're going to shut down the financial markets to where literally they're going to uh, control all of our finances. And there's other things that I've heard about. When it happens, it's going to happen. I don't sit at my house thinking, what am I going to have to do to make sure I'm financially taken care of. That's not my job. 
Remember when the, the, uh, the panic of Y2K? Remember that in 2000? That mass computer outages because computers were not programmed to go from 1999 to 2000. We had a, um, and I, I got sucked in that when I was pastoring down in Southwest Virginia. I had a man, um, he was a preacher and he was involved in all that prognostication and Y2K and stuff like that. And so he came and spoke to the church and the church asked him, all kind, how can we as a church be prepared? And he said, where is your safest place that you can have a, um, not, not a generator, but a place to store money? A safe. And so one of the members said, well, I think it'd be a great idea if we just dig up the concrete and put the money in there. <laughs> what? It would cost more money to rip up the carpet, to put, uh, dig up the hole, and the mess it would make, to, and then to buy a concrete safe. It would cost more money and more hassle to do that than to find another way. And so... We got done, and he left, and the next Sunday, I said, we'll talk about what we heard, and, and I spent all week thinking, that guy was a nut. What can I, as a pastor, do to, to calm stuff down? Because literally there were people that were, that Monday, going to the bank and taking out all their money and literally keeping it in their house because they were afraid that when January 1st, 2000, they couldn't get their money. What are they going to do? Well, January 1st, the holiday, you can't do nothing with the base anyway. That's so after all that, I just told the folks, I said, folks, I mean, I did some heart searching. God, what do I do? What can I do to guide the church? And God says, are you going to listen more to the prognosticators or are you going to trust me with your future? I will guide you. I've guided you this far. I'll guide you through January 1st of 2000. And so I told the church, said, after all the hysteria, I said, okay, we're going to pray. And then I had scripture verse about trusting God. I said, now we, then I said, had a big old whiteboard up there. And I put down what we need, what we think we need to do. What does God want us to do? So I let all those things, they had all kinds of ways where we're going to dig up the concrete. We're going to uh, make a huge place on the backside of our property. And we're going to have fencing and we're going to have barbed wire. It's going to be electric. I think, man, this is going to be more secure than Fort Knox. After all that was done, I said, now, what does God want us to do? And one of the guys says, well, I think God wants us to do all this. I said, I'm not worried about what you think. What has God told us in the scriptures to do? We finally came down to Proverbs chapter 3. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. And I put that all up there. I said, now as a church, are we going to do what we think we need to do? Or are we going to do what God tells us to do? And, one, and then one of our elder brothers said, well, now that you put it that way, I think it'd be safe for us to listen to God. You think? And we did. And guess what happened on January 1st, 2000? Nothing. Computers just work like normal. We can overanalyze stuff. We can list all these different people, but in the end, there's only one person knows about the future. That is God. So we've got to limit our tomorrows. But then also, the future will not be like the past. Um, go back to Matthew chapter 6. We'll look at that same verse. The future will not be like the past. Matthew 6. We just read in verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. For the sometimes I think, 
man, I can't wait for tomorrow because it can't get any worse. You ever said that? And then tomorrow comes thinking, I should have been thankful for yesterday because this is horrible what's going on here. Or things totally change. Every day has its own specific aspects. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's why you don't go into the future. Why would you want to bring tomorrow's problems into today when we can't help we have going on with our own lives anyway? And we don't want to drag the stuff from the past into the present because it. why would we want to muddy our lives even more by bringing the past or the unknown into our lives? Let's just live for today. We spend our lives as a tale that is told. All of us are writing a book. And then when we are said and gone, people will talk about the different chapters about your life. We spend our lives to tell that is told. And so the future, as much as it would be nice to understand it, probably would scare us. If we, as kids, now I remember in science and in history, they talk about we have in our, our books pictures of Flying cars. That's so what the future is going to be like. Can you imagine how bad it is when people are in cars on the earth driving on solid ground? What it would be like with people flying in the air? <laughs> it's so, total chaos. You'd have people fly up and down and all over and, and just it would be horrible. So thank God there's no flying cars yet. So, the future is not going to be like the past. But then also, we'll end with this, the future will not be like you expect. If you think about your youth and what you thought about what your future would be like, does it match up? I can't say mine matches up. We have all these expectations and thoughts about and all these dreams, and sometimes those dreams just don't pan out. Let's look at a couple verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'll end with this. 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, and then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. The future will not be like you expect. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God had prepared for them that love him. Once again, i got to go back, and all of us can relate going window shopping with our parents. We'd go and into the uh, New River Shopping Center and go to the, Ro the Roses department store. Or we'd go downtown to the Gibsons. Or we'd go to the uh, Montgomery Ward or the Otasco store. All those different stores that were closed on Sundays. And we would go looking. Oh, or we'd, we'd walk around the corner to the AMC car dealership and I look at the AMC Pacers and all. Man, I can't wait to have one of these cars. That's going to be really cool. I'm going to be driving a fishbowl. That will be awesome. <laughs> They're not even existence anymore. It doesn't match up with what I thought my, my, my future would be like. And so sometimes it's just best to be thankful for what we have right now. And understanding the times and living the best way we can with the knowledge we have of our past. And bringing that knowledge and wisdom to be able to apply for the present today. And yes, look forward to the future. But then sometimes don't try to mold in your mind what the future is going to look like. Because it's not even going to be close. Can you imagine in our little thinking what heaven's going to be like? All of our thoughts and thinking and our, our dreams. We're going to be shocked to what heaven's going to be like. I, I can imagine a lot of drop jaws like, wow. 
for the very first time, there'd be a lot of speechless people. Just because everything they thought, how grandiose it is, how glorious it's going to be, it's not even going to touch what it truly is. And so the future will not be like what you expect. We serve a great God. And let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Understand about our times, but then don't drag the past in there. But don't forget that you have to live for today because you may not have a tomorrow. Let's take you some prayer requests. Anybody have a prayer request? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yes. Sure. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Anybody else? Pray request. Unspoken. Holly. That's frustrating. Very frustrating to them. Right. And all this thing when I... Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely keep mom in prayer and the family in prayer because there's nothing worse than to see someone literally self-destruct in front of their very eyes. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely pray for you and for mom. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Definitely pray for the weather. Pray for the services on Sunday. This is uh, 4th of July weekend. And uh, to think about this great country and to pray for our country. And uh, thank God. I mean, no matter how bad it is, she's still the greatest country in the whole wide world. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. And so let's definitely keep our country in prayer. Pray for our church services on Sunday. That God would be honored and blessed throughout the services. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's scary. It's scary what the prospects of you just never know where people look like they're healthy, but then um one of my brother in laws pray for him because this big strong person all of a sudden goes through some problems, all of a sudden he just literally had to take him to the hospital, get some assistance with that. Another one, they thought he may have had a stroke. And so these are, I mean, the the very bedrock of their family. And the family's just like, what do we do? If you can go fall apart, what's going to happen to us? And so there's a lot of uncertainty with health issues and families. And so um, I've, I've never seen anything like it. It just seemed like everywhere, like you said, everywhere you go, there's something that's debilitating or hurtful that happens to very people that we know and care about. So, and so it's it is a scary thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I am thrilled to be able to come and visit with so many folks here because this is a family bigger than what I had left in Ohio. Sure, sure. Okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am.
<laughs> we, I mean, the house that was next to us was up for rent. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You never know what people are carrying, what type of burdens or problems or what, what they're needing that God may use you or your family to touch, to touch them. You just, you just never know. Mm-hmm. 